take the our final panelist of the session yasmin lari ji from from pakistan uh, yasmin ji yasmin ji yeah i'm uh, yasmin ji yeah you're not audible now. yeah am i can you hear me now yes yes welcome welcome to the session Hello to everybody and greetings from pakistan thank you so much anjali and engage network and praxis for this opportunity i'm honored to participate in this important discourse for engagement of communities with heritage preservation efforts and really a wonderful example that we saw uh, presented by dr may whose excellent work i know well and also from muzaffar ansari muzaffar mia kya acha aap kaam kar rahe ho bahut khushi hui dekh kar ke aap kya kuch aapne achieve kar liya so um, as in the case of many other countries especially those struggling with their post colonial legacies in pakistan cultural heritage has been almost exclusively looked after by government agencies i believe that among the factors that are hampering the care of a vast number of heritage properties in pakistan is the lack of engagement of the most important stakeholders consisting of the surrounding communities for me it has always been important to find tasks for the local people in safeguarding our heritage to develop a stake in the sense of pride among them most of my humanitarian programs are women centric and it has been my effort to involve as many women as possible in heritage related activities as well Now today I would like to discuss the Makli model. The key factors being Makli World Heritage Site, mendicant villages living in the shadow of the Makli necropolis, and uh, the mechanism of baza or barefoot social architecture that have led to community engagement and livelihood opportunities emerging from heritage-related activities. So uh, I'd like to start my presentation now. Just bear with me for a moment. Um, uh, can I can I get my video in, Anjali? I don't think. I think you've disabled me. Uh, you have to. You can you know, share now. You can share it now. Can, okay, just a moment. Uh, let me see. Am I getting it? No. Uh, ah, yeah. There we are. Good. Thank you. So there, there it is. And uh, let's start. Let me see if I can maximize it. Uh, there we are. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So um uh now first a little bit about uh, Heritage Foundation of Pakistan for me heritage and humanitarian assistance are closely linked in many cases lessons learned from heritage are applied on humanitarian architecture and on the other those learned while learning while while providing humanitarian assistance help in dealing with the complex issues of heritage safeguarding so really when i'm working in both the fields it's really been very useful for me to be able to learn and apply to the other So I will touch upon four segments uh, of our work. Uh, one is barefoot social architecture, or, or uh, the barefoot model, or baza. Then Makli mendicant villages that I'd like to just uh, briefly show you what they are, and Makli world heritage and community engagement, and how we are proceeding with that. And then lowering the carbon footprint in heritage preservation. This is something that I feel very is very important now, considering climate change impact and so on. So I'll discuss that a little bit as well. And then. Uh, So uh, first we go on to the barefoot social architecture. Now all those without shoes are my fellow travelers today. And uh, uh, I've learned that walking barefoot can teach you how to tread lightly on the planet. So you don't overuse or misuse planet's resources. As you're probably aware, my humanitarian architecture consists of zero carbon structures in the pursuit of social and ecological justice for disadvantaged sections of society. Over the years, I have de devised methodologies that would also lower the carbon footprint of heritage preservation interventions. Since these require lower skill requirements, this strategy benefits local semi-skilled people, including women, because we have to see how we can keep on engaging women into the whole process as well. So, the Makli model of community engagement with heritage is a result of the work carried out pr primarily with disaster-affected marginalized communities since 2005, when we had a huge earthquake in Pakistan. So in the last decade and a half I've been working on these issues and the application of tenets of barefoot social architecture of Baza that I founded a few years ago. Oops. So Baza is akin to social engineering for bringing about social change incorporating environmental, cultural and technical dimensions resulting in transformation of mindsets from a cycle of dependency to a culture of pride and self-reliance. Baza fosters co-building and co-creation 
through its partiality for zero carbon footprint structures using ubiquitous earth, conservatives, magic lime, and renewable bamboo. These are the three materials that I use. Now, between 2011 and 18, using Vaza mechanism, we have been able to reach out to 0.84 million people or over 100,000 persons per year through provisions of basic needs. And we've been able to work towards 12 of the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So now, uh, the other four tenets of Vaza, maximizing the potential of the barefoot ecosystem, zero carbon Unistic architecture, fostering pride, uh, dignity, and well-being, delivery of unmet needs, and non-engineered structures for shrinking the carbon footprint. Now, uh, this is uh, these tenets promote a holistic approach and social and ecological justice to address rising poverty levels and increase disparities around the world. Because this is something that after COVID-19, we all have to probably be very, very mindful of. And um, now we look at Baza Tenant Poet, which is maximizing the potential of the barefoot ecosystem. So here is the wide ranging ecosystem with uh, its barefoot economy, barefoot markets, barefoot enterprises, barefoot entrepreneurs, barefoot services and barefoot products. Uh, and, and this is really uh, which helps sustain a parallel economy, an inclusive economy based on the unmet needs of the poor, which is totally divergent and disparate from the market economy, which is only for personal gain and not for social good. So these are the, these are the basic parameters under which we are working. Now, standard number two is uh, zero carbon humanistic architecture. And uh, all construction draws upon tradition and heritage. We learn a lot from tradition. Uh, we've done lots of studies and so on, but also there's something that we keep on experiencing. And this inculcates pride and dignity for the sustenance of the soul. Sometimes you forget that that's also important when we are, especially when we're constructing, that uh, the intangibles also have to be taken care of. And so in this connection, I have this palette, which is uh, earth, lime and bamboo. These are local sustainable materials and use, uh, and, and use with which our rural communities, especially women, are familiar with, which makes co-building easier to implement along with technical interventions for safe building techniques. I've also used them with great success for providing emergency interventions for heritage safeguarding and bamboo domes as a reversible alternative while conserving heritage of high value. Uh, this had never been done before and I was under a lot of uh, criticism also, but I think these are things that now we have to learn to do because that's one way of saving our heritage. So Earth, uh, if I may just very quickly go through that, it's uh, ever present as we know, it's most freely available everywhere and it's most used around the world, but mostly by the poor and not so much by architects who are building for the 1%, the wealthy 1%. Then there's lime, of course, and all those working in the field of heritage conservation are familiar with the amazing qualities of lime. I popularized lime for humanitarian assistance, particularly for stabilizing earth. Due to, assist, due to the usage of lime, our earth structures can now survive the onslaught of rain and flooding because everything that I build, that we build, uh, are, uh, are uh, disaster resilient. So whether it's an earthquake or a high wind or rain, it should withstand everything. And bamboo is among the most important important elements for climate change mitigation and adaptation as it stores carbon. The quality of its resilience is extraordinary and it has become the mainstay of my work. Sorry, where am I now? Yeah, and then we come to the tenet number three, which is Biscus or Barefoot Incubator for Social Good and Environmental Sustainability. Biscus is designed for training, mentoring and monitoring the marginalized in green skills and barefoot enterprises. Uh, in order for them to make low cost quality products for the other poor for their primary requirements and unmet needs. And uh, these are, uh, um, this is the Barefoot Incubator a place where we, this is called Zero Carbon Cultural Center and the Zero Carbon Campus as all bamboo st structure, as you can see, it's, it's quite large. It's about 57 feet wide, 80 feet long and 27 feet high and built only entirely with bamboo. And that's where we uh, carry out all our trainings. And I'll just show you some of the uh, images from inside where the training is going on. You can see there's a predominantly there are women and we're trying to give them lead roles so that they're able to carry on with the work. And, and surprisingly, what happens is when women take on, then men also join in. So it's not like we are really kind of uh, uh, dissuading men from, from uh, also becoming active. And these are these eight villages. Uh, it shows uh, the slide shows production of affordable items being produced in specialized villages to cater for the unmet needs of the other poor. 
Each of the eight villages specializes in affordable, good quality products consisting of green construction materials such as earth, lime, bamboo and thatch, organic soap and compost and natural fuel briquettes, climate smart farming for food security, craft products for everyday use in which designs and techniques are drawn from Makri monuments, all providing livelihoods and for achieving a better quality of life for surrounding impoverished communities because all these products are sold among the poor. And uh, here is a... Um, um, you know, the World Habitat winner other than Pakistan Chula, but I wanted to show this to you because we have these intermediaries known as barefoot entrepreneurs for helping to guide the process of construction, sales of products and other services. This approach has resulted in substantial earnings for the bees, the barefoot entrepreneur. For example, in the case of Pakistan Chula, which you see here, uh, of which 60,000 have been built by housewives, one team have, has, which helped to build 30,000 of them and by charging a meager sum of rupees 200 has earned 6 million rupees over four years. So that's a substantial income considering what they used to earn before. And this is possible for many of the products because the, uh, as you know, the barefoot economy is really, really large. And most people have not bothered to look at it. Uh, and then this is Baza tenant number four, which is non-engineered structures for shrinking ecological footprint. Now, uh, this is something very important because I think we have to look, when we look at these materials, a lot of times you don't, you're not able to really have uh, calculations done for them. And I haven't, sh I haven't got the slide here from, with me because of the time constraint, but we've actually tested them on shaking table tests and uh, they've gone, I mean, for, those, for uh, seismic testing and, and uh, up to 670% of, uh, of uh, Kobe earthquake, nothing happened to my bamboo and mud structure. So that's where the, you know, the, the amazing quality of this, these materials are. So uh, this is, a, uh, again, a non engineered structure. Uh, this is, uh, has placed Pakistan in the lead as the largest zero carbon shelter program. As you see, no carbon emissions, no trees fell, 1,750 villages and, and 300,000 persons were housed just through this particular one. And you can see 15 people can stand on the roof. So they're very, very strong. And I just wanted to show you this very quickly because this is a prefab, uh, prefab construction of, uh, with bamboo. And uh, you can make very simple uh, one-room houses, which we are mostly doing since the last three years uh, for, for the poor, but these can equally be used for, uh, for uh, eco-tourism and so on and so forth. And you can see that if you have eight of them, you make a, a, a room, but if you add on two more, uh, you can make into a, a kind of a classroom for a village, or if you add, uh, which is 12 by 18, and if you add another two, then you can make a, uh, a large a village center about 18 foot by 18 feet wide. And these are all materials that are used from the, the dome we've learned from Makli. That is how we are learning from heritage and from, uh, you know, experiences that we've had. And you can see how this works. So I just wanted to now show you the, on the left is a, is a, is a, is a log, uh, the, 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 eight, the 12 foot by 12 foot room, the eight sided log. And on the right is a, uh, what we call the interbow. Uh, training and resource center. So you can do quite a lot with this kind of material. Now, I just wanted to show you what kind of uh, uh, living conditions our Makli mendicants have. And you can see that it's pretty disturbing. And uh, 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 this is something that's really, uh, you see quite a lot of it. And, uh, and poverty levels, I think, are going to make everything much worse. And here you see how, uh, how we can, uh, once we uh, started our interventions, uh, we were able to, uh, you know, take up this right space development for 800 families. Their lives were transformed. The villages were cleaned up through community voluntary effort with hope of dignified living. The residents were ready to undertake trainings under Biscus, you know, our barefoot incubator. Their trainings were carried out in 2019, as I mentioned earlier. Now we come to segment number three, which is Makli World Heritage Site and Community Engagement. Here's a map on the left of Makli. Uh, it's a, uh, runs about 12 kilometers, it spans over 14 to 17 centuries, so it's about 400 years. And it's a unique mix of tangible and intangible heritage. That's why it has so many beggars and mendicants all around it, because there are lots of, uh, lots of shrines here. And, uh, uh, and, and that's why we, we just had to somehow uh, manage to get, get the, the mendicant community involved with us. And I just thought I'll just show you a few of the, a few of the monuments that are there. It's a, it's a huge necropolis, one of the most amazing sites. And as you can see, uh, uh, it's, it's something quite remarkable. And these are some of the monuments that we have conserved uh, um, uh, in the last uh, you know, several years, actually. And this is the most important one, which has had the most impact, actually, in terms of developing the, uh, the craft of Kashi, which is now being spread into villages. Uh, this is the tomb of Sultan Ibrahim. And... Um, uh, it's really the conservation work on this. It's a Timurid monument, 
which had been adorned with the first Cascio Glacier Amectas, and it's really something very beautiful. And the work was carried out with support of U.S. Ambassadors Fund and UNESCO Paris. And then uh, I just wanted to show you the work, the kind of replicas we made, but we were very careful. We did not actually uh, put them everywhere, uh, only where the evidence was there and where we felt that, you know, there was nothing else to be shown of the old. Uh, that is where they were put. But there's calligraphy and there's beautiful patterns. And so we learned the craft and the craft then uh, we were able to teach then to, um, then to the communities around. So in the beginning, it was well nigh impossible to attract mendicants for carrying out any work. They were prepared to receive handouts, but were not willing to work. And so one brave woman, and you see her in the middle uh, on the, the, you know, on the right, uh, she's the one who, who joined us uh, by agreeing to learn the craft of Kashi or glaze style. She became our first ally from the mendicant villages. She gave up seeking arms, got herself trained in the production of miniature tiles and jewelry products, as you can see, some of it is there. And she became a barefoot entrepreneur and began to sell her products from the place where she used to seek arms from. And that had a tremendous effect on the whole community. So uh, again, you can see um, we're training women with all kinds of things, like you know they're making um, mud, earth breaks and, and, and all kinds of products. And they're doing extremely well, I have to tell you, because I, I just have full faith in my women. They do an amazing, amazing uh, work. And I just thought I'll just show you uh, this one. This is, uh, again, uh, something uh, that they've been making. And uh, I just wanted to also actually say that in, in 2019, with a grant from the British Council and in collaboration with Glasgow University, the project uh, titled Green Skills and Crafts for Livelihoods was taken up. Out of 230 that were trained, 50 with disabilities, along with mentoring and monitoring, it was found that within 14 months, 70% had risen above the poverty line by taking advantage of the barefoot ecosystem and making sales in surrounding villages. So the poor do not have to really sell to the rich. They can do very well, thank you, with just you know, spreading uh, and marketing around themselves. And so the most productive village was the one that was trained in terracotta and glazed ceramics, uh, the one drawn from Sultan Ibrahim's Kashi products and uh, you know, from households using bowls and glasses and spoons, et cetera, to terracotta wash basins and mirror frames, as well as a variety of terracotta tiles. So they are just some of the examples. Once the villages uh, had been trained, they had given up seeking arms. And in addition to being trained in green skills, they become in, became interested also in working on heritage sites. And so we you know, really took a leap in that. And you see my, again, a women's brigade uh, cleaning up the heritage site. So uh, this uh, has helped us uh, really um, uh, to train them, to be able to uh, do very careful cleaning. And they've done a phenomenal job of, uh, of, of really doing it very, very carefully and diligently so that everything is you know, cleaned up and saved and put away because there's just so much of uh, shards and, and all kinds of stuff that is you know, from ancient times is still lying there. And uh, then there's another team that you can see, um, there they are, they're all working and cleaning and, and so on. And uh, I just wanted to show you the possibilities that are there uh, with the, uh, you know, how we can engage communities. Now, this is the last part of my, my presentation, lowering the carbon footprint in heritage preservation. Now, my life's mission today is to find ways to provide assistance to impoverished communities, as well as help reduce greenhouse gas emissions with the dictum, low cost, zero carbon footprint and zero waste. I mean, this is something that I believe in and I'm really trying to diligent, diligently follow this. Accordingly, I've been developing methodologies to use earth and bamboo in heritage preservation as well. On the one hand, it, it lowers the carbon footprint. On the other, it opens up possibilities for the non or semi-skilled workers to participate, especially those living in the city of, of heritage sites. And that way, I think with very low cost, we can make a lot of difference in terms of conservation. Now, this is a tomb, which is a 15th century monument. It was in a highly endangered state, and it seemed that it would collapse as soon as we touched it. It is the bamboo supports that prevented the collapse of oversailing parts. Also, as much of the internal brick masonry had disintegrated and no evidence of any treatment could be found, the lacunae had been filled in with mud bricks, which had stabilized the structure. The production of earth bricks was carried out by local artisans. The work was carried out with support of Prince Klaus Fund of the Netherlands. And uh, then there's another example. Uh, this is the, Mirza, the, the tomb of Mirza Jan Baba, uh, which has now these three zero carbon bamboo domes. Now, this is an example where bamboo cupolas have been utilized to provide protection to the canopy. The bamboo structure has been designed based on available evidence. The bamboo completes the form without resorting to a stone replica. This reversible and light option has helped provide protection to a heritage of high value, which is, you know, the graves below, which were entirely exposed to the weather for, for several decades. And uh, at the same time, maintaining aesthetic unity and harmony of the structures. 
Now, the work on Bamboo Dome was carried out by local artisans. There again, we found something for them to do. Now, if it was something else, then we would have had to have very highly skilled people to come and do it. And that's why I think lowering the, lowering the carbon footprint using these particular materials can help us to reach out to communities quite a lot. And for this, uh, support was received from, uh, from the German government. And then uh, there's the third one, which is the tomb of Munir Makhuri, which actually is being conserved with the help of uh, Prince Klaus Fund. Now, uh, the, the proposal that I've sh I show you on the, on the right, I mean, the left is the, its condition. Um, a lot of uh, domes are, are, have been lost in, in Makli. And I feel that we could really provide a lot of protection if only we were to cover it. But just to put a flat roof would not be good enough. So if you have, uh, you know, you can follow the evidence and try to see what kind of cupola or form it was, then it would be much more interesting. So it says how at a very low cost by placing a bamboo roof rep replica that would provide protection to the high heritage value mihrab structure, which as you can see is, is beautifully ornamented with glazed ceramic tiles and using other low carbon, low cost carbon treatments, uh, the life of such monuments can be extended until resources allow conservation works to be taken in hand. So by using bamboo structures and forms based on available evidence can provide protection at a very low cost, along with engaging low skilled local community members to the part uh, to, to be part of heritage safeguarding efforts. Now, this is my last slide. So I'm going to try to see if I can uh, remove this from here. Yeah. Yes, and uh, this is my last two paras. As you can see, there can be many ways to engage communities and also women in heritage safeguarding. Wherever possible, by using sustainable materials, we are providing opportunities to communities in such efforts which had not been possible before. Such strategies help to lower the carbon footprint at the same time allow semi-skilled local artisans to earn while prolonging the life of, of cultural heritage. It is my belief that creating opportunities in the heritage field which would benefit surrounding communities is the only sustainable way to take care of the vast and diverse reservoirs of cultural heritage that countries such as Pakistan are endowed with. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Over to you, Anjali. Uh, thank you, Yasmindi. That was quite a, quite a marathon. Yeah. yeah. And loads and loads of work. It, it was very, 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 very inspiring. And the range of, pro uh, you know, the range of issues that you have dealt with, the range of uh, strategies that you've been able to successfully uh, you know manage it's it's uh, it's amazing it's amazing uh, uh, so we have one question uh, sandeep ji would you like to uh, give an overview before or should i just shoot the questions right away yeah, yeah i think let's go ahead with the question first yeah because i think we have about 10 10 12 minutes left now so uh, the first uh, first question is to uh, is for yasmin yasmin ji uh, bhanumati vishwanathan asks could you elaborate more on the initial process of involving people and the funding for the empowerment of the community in tangible preservation? Yes, I was a tricky question. And uh, of course, uh, getting access to communities is not an easy task at all. Uh, uh, the entry is very, very difficult. You really have to work hard. But I have to say that now that we have done quite a lot of work, it's not so difficult for us to, I mean, I go anywhere and I think I can start anything that I really would like to do. Um, but the, the fact is that funding, uh, you know, the kind of funding you get from international sources, I think is very limiting because I think there are always, uh, um, um, you know, sort of concepts attached to it, which I don't believe in. I really believe that the best thing is if we don't have too much money and then we can do so much more work, uh, which will be far more uh, productive, which will be much more sustainable. So I really don't like to look for funding. Uh, if we get it for training, I'm very happy. But anything else, I think we want to just build people's own capacities and tell them that they, they don't have to you know, be looking for, for sources. They can rely on themselves. And, uh, and this, is, this is what I'm trying to do now. And I'm hoping that with tutorials that we are, we are developing, uh, which are uh, hopefully will get to every cell phone, uh, they will learn how to build better, how to be able to survive better, how to do some things that will be better for all the people around them. So if we can just get this out, uh, you know, I think money will not matter too much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, now, uh, uh, while we are still with Yasmin, I'll first uh, ask you a few questions because uh, I think uh, one difference that uh, we see on all, all, all our three presentations, if you look at them, there, there's one is living heritage, you know, where people are still practicing a certain tradition and are losing it because of uh, various reasons. There is a, and then you reinforce that understanding of uh, what they already have. So whether it is skills, whether it is an understanding, whether it is relationships that they are engaging with. Uh, and I think your work shows a lot of that. 
Uh, whereas in cities, what we are finding, like uh, we saw in the in the case uh, of Dr. May, uh, and also to some extent, and there is a is a very a very very interesting example of both, where you saw both living uh, traditions of uh, weaving along with uh, Kabir uh, Vani's uh, and old structures and old buildings that need to be preserved. One thing that everybody is facing as a problem is that. once a tradition is lost when a community is no longer living with a particular tradition then how do you preserve it whereas in your case whether it is the use of uh, wood bamboo or lime these are traditions that a lot of traditional communities still continue to use and therefore to revive it is relatively easier what is your experience been on that well you know uh, sandeep when i first started i was told that um, you know nobody will want uh, earth buildings mud is not taboo because everybody wants concrete and and all international agencies that were working in pakistan said that and then uh, something happened very strange in 2010 that uh, uh, money became uh, short you know there was a donor fatigue that got in after 2010 you know floods and so on and when that happened then suddenly somebody remembered that you know there's yasmilar who's working you know cheap buildings and this and they let's find out what she's doing and that's how i got a chance that's why i don't put any store on money because the more money there is then nobody looks at you know proper solutions so <laughs> the less the less funding there is then you say okay fine let's find a way to do it right and uh, uh, and because of lime uh, uh, you know i just you know we started building and and uh, everything that i do today and people that build are are is a disaster uh, resilient so um I, i think we have to change the whole concept of what is what is good and you know what should be done and that's why we need good designers here in the field because the where there's deficits where there's deficit and this poverty you need good designers you need good design not less design so you need really good designers to be part of it and i i miss architects in all this because there are not many architects working in these fields we've got to get the young people involved in this and then the whole thing will change because once earth and lime and bamboo uh, become respectable then why everybody would want to have them and that's what we have to do it change the whole thing and rather than the urbanized solution that we take to villages it should be the other way around now let's look at our traditions there's a there's a question uh, along the same theme i think as to uh, how do you convince people to use bamboo and lime and why uh you know <laughs> you know when we first started and we were wanted we did this bamboo roof nobody believed it will work so we said okay first, when the first house gets built you know 15 people just climb over it and they did and you know so every time the house was built uh, you know 40000 in i think each one was tested and they found it was okay yes. so i think you have to, got to prove it and like when i was doing something with shangla and you know this shaking table test i got done because nobody would believe that it would uh, uh, just bam- bamboo and earth will be able to withstand any kind of uh, any kind of earthquake uh, shocks and jolts so i think we just have to keep on proving more research more work and i again i, I really want architects i mean i'm working uh, with the lowest of cost and basic materials and you know as little as possible so that the costs remain controlled but you know if architects were working for let's say the 1% the wealthy 1% that i talk about uh, then they could do spectacular things with the same materials i mean come on earth and lime and bamboo is are amazing in uh, when they use, use them so why are they there maybe they can do amazing things yeah. you can do amazing things with that yeah. yes, thank you thank you